All right. Um, first, Greg sort of alluded to this when he was taking survey in the room. The incidence of cuff pathology overall for all, just take a population, is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 30 percent. 20 percent of those are going to be over the age of 65. So if you just take 2010 estimates, there's about 57 million people in the United States at that time. So that's about 5.7 million people walking around with rotator cuff tear. And there's only about 250 to 270,000 repairs done a year. So that means less than less than 5% of all cuff tears are actually being treated. So it just gives you a sense of the prevalence and actually what comes up clinically and walks into our office. Um, I'm not advancing. You want, can I use your remote? Yours seems to be working. Okay. Uh, let me just see. I, I, it seems like you're working, I'm not. Can I use your remote? You don't want to give it up, do you? <laughs> I won't leave with it, I promise. All right, great. This is an another interesting study by Yamaguchi, which I cite for a lot of my patients. If you are diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear on one side, and you start to have shoulder pain on the other side, there's about a 75% chance that that's also a rotator cuff tear, either partial thickness or full thickness. So it gives you some sense that this is a degenerative process that in many ways may even be genetically predetermined. I think it might be blocked. That's what's going on here. So what you heard from the last speaker, which is particularly interesting, is that there seems to be, so am I gonna have to do it, just ask you to advance slide? How are we gonna do this? All right, go back, okay. I'll go like this, okay? <laughs> All right, testing me, okay. So um, there seem, this is something I think that is equally fascinating is, how patients perceive the problem. There's this propensity for individuals with anything that causes pain to potentially catastrophize what they have. And there's some really good literature in the, in, with rotator cuff that that is a mainstream concept in terms of how you can predict someone to do well. So we're doing some really interesting collaborative work with the Department of Psychiatry now to figure out where patients are on the spectrum for things like anxiety, hypomania, depression, and so forth, which I think is a very important aspect that you and I have to consider when we're managing any patient with any problem, but it's very specific to pain procedures such as that with problems that cause knee pain and those problems actually cause shoulder pain. The other thing that's interesting that we recently looked at is if you ask a patient what they want to get out of the procedure, you think, well, I just want to get rid of my pain. This is something that was recently published that where we looked at patient preferences preoperatively and then we assessed them postoperatively. The take home is that patients really would like to have a strong shoulder even if it is at the expense of having mild pain. So they want pain relief, but they really want strength. And that's why we place so much emphasis on an intact cuff, all these different me methods that we're talking about, different uh, tr suture uh, uh, metrics and so forth in terms of pullout, different configurations, basically because an intact cuff most likely is always going to be better than a cuff that re-tears. So what do we know? We know that pain is more likely in larger tears. We know pain is uh, more likely when biceps pathology exists, when there's fatty infiltration, older patients and those that have scapular thoracic dysfunction. So it shows that the role that you as therapists have in managing these patients. We also know that pain cannot predict progression and about 40% of tears will progress over two to four years. This is another great study that I think is absolutely worth knowing by everyone in this room. This is a population of patients who presented with a large or chronic rotator cuff tear. I don't even want to say large. They presented with a chronic pre-existing rotator cuff tear that became symptomatic. And the recommendation was to undergo conservative non-surgical treatment with physical therapy. About 80% of them at five years still remain surgery free. And the number one variable had nothing to do with the rotator cuff configuration and anatomy, but rather did the patient believe that physical therapy would help? That was it. So the point is that why a patient with a chronic cuff tear becomes symptomatic at some point is, is poorly understood. And I'd submit to you that the day before they became painful, there's probably nothing different about their anatomy, but something else that we don't completely understand. So this is the evaluation time. So it's the basic stuff that we learn as medical students. History, inspection, palpation, some provocative maneuvers, and then tests that we can do in the office to sort of predict what the MRI might show us. So the history, I've done this before, and I think this is just to give you, this is how we take a basic history. Go ahead and start the video. Go back. How old are you? 55. Are you right-handed? Yes. Prior to three weeks ago, how were your shoulders doing? 
relatively well. I had just minor night pain, but relatively well. Okay. Years ago, you were told you had a left shoulder rotator cuff tear? Correct. Treated without surgery, no intervention? Just therapy. And it got better? Correct. What happened three weeks ago? I tripped and I landed and braced myself with my hands and then noticed pain. Got it. And you went to see a doctor? Correct. And they ordered x-rays and an MRI and what have you been told? Uh, full tears in both shoulders and bicep okay. separated in this one. Uh, have you trouble sleeping? Yes. Have you trouble doing things with both arms? Yes, more so the right. If your right one was not a problem, would you be here for your left? Probably not. What would you most like to see happen? No pain. In full. The best thing, when I try to put my hair in a ponytail, I can't do it. I okay. have to do this. That's my best explanation of what's wrong with my right shoulder. Okay. Thank you. It's notable that night pain is the number one reason that people ultimately have surgery, by the way. That's the number one deciding factor. So the basic stuff, and inspection. Inspection, really important. We view from the back, we view from the front. You can pick up scapular asymmetries. Really important because if we're going to engage in rehab, that's one of the principles. Obviously, you can assess if they have chronic problems like this, uh, the clavicle basically sticking, sticking out of the top of the shoulder because the scapula is sinking down from a high-grade AC separation. Um, we, we palpate, and you can find some basic things. People come in, well, I'm here to, if you take, to evaluate my shoulder, but then they say most of my pain is up here. We know that's probably a different problem. If they hurt over the biceps, they hurt over the core cord or the pec minor, uh, those are things that can often be managed with rehab, maybe an injection. If they hurt over the cuff insertion, frankly, I'm not sure what to make of that because you can pretty much push on most patients, you're going to find some tenderness, so I don't really know what to do with cuff insertional pain, quite frankly. If they hurt in the back, sometimes that's important because it might be a ganglion in the supraspinatus fossa. Posterior glenohumeral pain, if you put your thumb in the back of the glenohumeral joint, that might be osteoarthritis. And superiorly, it could be the AC joint, it could be a ganglion, and so forth. Just to give you a sense, if you know the anatomy, where you're pushing can help you. But keep in mind, just because it hurts when you push, you still need to ask the patient, is that the problem that you have? Because we could find lots of parts around our bodies that you press on and it hurts, and it has nothing to do with the reason the patient is in your office. Now, what about range of motion with pain? These are some real clues when you're evaluating the patient. If they have global motion loss, there's only a couple things that really cause that. That's osteoarthritis and, adhe and adhesive capsulitis. And you can pretty much figure it out when you walk in the room which one they're going to have. Um, if they have loss of internal rotation, typically that's posterior capsular contracture. Maybe that's your young athletic population, overhead, overhead athlete. If they have pain above 90 degrees but not below, we're generally thinking more cuff type problems. If they have pain below 90 degrees, you're thinking arthritis or uh, adhesive capsulitis. So those are some basic clues that can help you get a differential diagnosis without ever taking an x-ray or an MRI. So there's two types of lag signs that we typically use. One is the abduction external rotation lag sign, and that's really to look at the posterior superior cuff. And when you let go of the arm, they can't maintain active external rotation. They just drop because their posterior superior cuff is weak. Then there's the adduction external rotation sign. That's when the arm is at the side, and that's the anterior superior cuff. Same thing. They can't, you can get them passively, but you can't get them to maintain it. So when you let go, their arm kind of flops back. And then you can call it, I guess, an internal rotation lag sign, but there's two ways to evaluate the subscap by physical examination. And this is some work that's been done both by MRI and EMG analysis. If you do the traditional subscap liftoff with the arm behind the back, that's the lower subscap. If you put your hand on your belly and keep your elbow forward, that's the upper subscap. But truth be told, most of us at some point are going to be getting an MRI, and the specificity of that is not so great. All right, so now we'll go through the other aspects of the physical exam. Go ahead and start it, please. So just basic forward elevation. You can turn the sound off. Like this, roll to the outside. Good. Maybe turn around. Maybe. That's okay. You can keep it. Nice. All right. So we're just doing basic assessment of what the, 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 the parameters that we measure for all of our outcome scales, forward elevation in the scapular plane, adduction, external rotation, and internal rotation going up behind your back. Those are the three basic motions that we'll generally capture. It's funny how some patients, when you ask them to elevate their arm, the first thing they do is bring their arm like this, especially the work comp patient. That's the first thing they try to do. You know, they can't get their arm up like this. Well, I can't get my arm up there either, right? So the point is, get it up in the scapular plane so they don't get the greater tuberosity hitting the top of the acromion, right? I mean, you almost know exactly who the payer is when their first movement is going out like this. Um, and then there's basic palpation, as I alluded to. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we make ample use of this. It's not just because we're looking to prove if they have impingement syndrome, but pain and motion loss are inexorably connected. So if you give them a subacromial injection, right, and they get rid of all their pain, 
there's some consideration that there's a pain generator going on in that region. And that could still be poor scapular mechanics because of secondary problems. But the point is that can also, that can be diagnostic and it can be therapeutic. And that same woman, go back please, that same woman who had painful arc, and go back one more and then forward and just tap the video. Now go forward, now tap the video if you could. So her pain is completely gone within about 15 seconds of a subacromial injection. Yes. And by the way, this woman who has a chronic cuff tear never came to surgery. She had six weeks of PT, and that was it, and she was done. The biceps, it's a tricky one, but there are ways to get to it. So I like direct palpation. Does it hurt? And yeah, is that the pain you get when you're active? Jurgensen and Speed's tests are really nonspecific in my experience. Um, one thing that we'd love to do, next slide is uh, when we see patients like this with biceps tendon problems, we like to give them injections, okay? So we'll do an ultrasound-guided injection, and that's one of the most effective ways to not only make sure you're getting in the right place, but this is one of those conditions that responds very favorably to an injection and physical therapy. So we like to know we're getting it there. Next slide. So then we've got imaging, and basic x-ray will help for your differential diagnosis. I'm not sure what to make of an acromial bone spur, quite frankly. I tell patients it's a normal variant, about one-third of the people have it. But you'll pick up things like calcific tendonitis. There's a difference, for example, of calcific tendonitis versus a, a cuff that has uh, uh, avulsion or bony deposits. Calcific tendonitis is in the tendon. When it's related to the cuff, it's much closer to the bony insertion, for example. Go back to the next slide, and go back to the next, go forward twice. One more. The MRI can be particularly helpful because it can help us figure out how long a cuff tear is there. And this is very important in terms of your management and it's important to educate your patient. The hardest discussion I have is when I'm with a patient, I say, look, you've had a long-standing cuff tear, especially when it's work comp, you've had a long-standing cuff tear and you've aggravated that. And the first thing I say is, I didn't have any pain before. I'm, I'm sure it happened yesterday. And you're trying to explain it. Sometimes I wish I never even entered the conversation because um, the, the fact of the matter is they need to understand that this is something they live with because the treatment is very, very different for that patient than it is for an acute tear. We do make use of diagnostic ultrasound. We use it mostly now for therapeutic endeavors, but we do like the diagnostic ultrasound because you give patients immediate feedback and you can tell them right then and there if they have a cuff tear. But we still struggle with, um, with uh, uh, evaluating the muscle and the, uh, the quality of the muscle. Okay, so what do we learn? Most patients with rotator cuff tear will never be seen in a physician's office. The history and physical can get you to the diagnosis without an x-ray and an MRI about 75% of the time. Non-operative treatment remains an option, and especially physical therapy, and as long as they believe physical therapy will help with a chronic cuff tear, I believe you can get most of your patients better. And I think it's very important to treat and educate our patients, not the MRI uh, or their perceptions of what the, uh, will happen if they choose to tolerate their condition without surgery. Said another way, most patients are concerned that if I neglect this, what will happen in the future, and that's something that you have to be prepared to address. Thank you.